Welcome to Pixel Tunes Radio, a podcast where we have fun talking about video games and video game music. I'm Iso Mike Trick, and I'm Angular Ed. Oh, okay. I had a good one this time. Yeah, yours is better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Episode 108 is what you're listening to, and we are talking about isometric jams. These are games that are isometric in graphical nature. But the tunes are definitely not isometric. No, no angles on these tunes. Yeah, we figured we'd do kind of a wide topic, because we get pretty specific sometimes. Individual characters or a particular system. We just kind of wanted to open things up, but not go like full uh, free picks. So we figured we'd take games that uh, utilize the isometric perspective in the gameplay and only use those games to pick cool music from. And it's cool because it helped us find a lot of games that we might not have looked at for soundtracks and pull some some cool tracks, at least in my uh, experience. There were a few games I never would have even right. uh, bothered looking at that I was like, oh man, these are some cool soundtracks, so I, I got to I, share some obscure stuff. I had to really kind of look back into my past, and I picked a lot of games that I played over the years that I was like, oh wait, that's isometric. That had a great soundtrack. Yep. So that was kind of what I went yeah, for. Yeah, same here. But before we get into that, let's jump into Clarification Corner. We have a slight thing to uh, clarify regarding the episode 107, the PC-98 episode. I knew somebody would get us with something. (laughs) So this one comes to us from the YouTube link, actually, for the YouTube episode. And it's from Internet Akias one And he, or she, told us that, don't call me Amy, as we called it last episode... It was actually originally composed by Kazuhiro Kanai for the YM2203, and Umimoto only arranged it for the game's PC-9821 version. Yeah, so we talked, uh, that was the last track that we played, that right. very kind of sad... Ending uh, track. do 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 yeah. kind of track. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I really wanted to pick something from Ryo Umimoto because he was such a prominent figure and, and known as kind of one of the best composers. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of bummed that you know the track that i picked had was originally and it was it was just arranged from another composer but remember the first track that we played from mm-hmm. that show yes. uh, went by the the Rawl 3 track yes. uh, we at the time of recording did not know who the composer was right. and i was doing a little more research just to get the publisher and the date and i found a page that said that Ryu Umamoto composed that game on his own yep. so we actually did get some original composition Woo-hoo! from Umamoto by accident uh, it's in, all me. in the show, so it's all me. yeah, so we had both the composition and an arrangement from him, which is totally fine. Yeah, in that's my cool. book, so um, good. yeah. But thank you, Internet Takayas One, for pointing that out to us. And I also didn't know about the YM twenty two oh three version. It, it wasn't mm-hmm. it wasn't working for me, and through his help, I was able to get a working version. Um, to be able to hear the same soundtrack mm. on the twenty two oh three chip. It's that's a little more cool. simplistic, but yeah. it's nice. Uh, hearing it without Umamoto's arrangements, because there's there are some differences here and there between the two, so it was, Very cool. it was cool to listen to. Yeah. So we'll jump right into Pixel Chat. we got a couple awesome questions. Uh, the first comes to us from Jay Jorgensen, and he writes, With the upcoming remake of Final Fantasy VII, I'm curious about which games you would take from the older generations that have not aged well and give them a remake. My first choice would have to be Legend of Dragoon. The addition mechanic in that game was innovative at the time, but it was incredibly difficult, and if not pulled off properly, made the game a tremendous slog. The story was fantastic, with the spoilers, just as a heads up, death at the end of the first disc setting up the rest of the game. The graphics were great for the time, and the music was awesome. So, I don't know, what do you think? Um, let's see. A remake that hasn't been done yet. I mean, that seems to be all the rage nowadays. I'd say there's more re-releases. Uh, these days more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, ports and re-releases and yeah. stuff. But there have been, like, remasters, remasters yeah. more than remakes. Yep, yep. Um, I think the, the the most remakes that have come out have probably been in, the, like, the Yeez series, Oath of Felgana, Memories of Celsetta, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, oh, man, I really have to think about this one. I would really like to see maybe something like some of the more obscure... I know you probably dig this. A lot of the... Um, like the Natsume games, like okay. redone, yeah, like Power Blade yeah. or Shadow of the Ninja. I'd actually Shatter prefer Hand. a sequel. I'd, I'd like, I'd like a sequel, like a Power Blade Three or Shatterhand Two. Yeah, uh, those, those, that would be awesome. But I think that would be cool. Kind of in the style of like Bionic Commando Rearmed, yep. where it still holds true to the original game, but gives it more updated graphics and maybe right. some updated gameplay. Yeah. 
that would be really cool. So I would, I would like to see those. A lot of those old NES games that, I mean, they still hold up today. They're still great games, but I would really love to see what they, you know, maybe the developers had a whole bunch of ideas for the game that they couldn't do on an NES. Mm -hmm. And that now that they have virtually like unlimited power with these consoles to kind of breathe new life into those, into those games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say Final Fight, honestly. Yeah. Because Final Fight as it is, is a fantastic experience. But I feel like it was dated even then, in the sense that it was a lot more simplistic than Streets of Rage, and they they try to like revise it with like Final Fight Three, for example, where they added in the more like Street Fighter esque moves and right. the Street Streets of Rage style moves and combos and everything. And I would love to see them kind of bring that into a brand new entry into the series or remake the original Final Fight, you know, add more levels, add more bosses, add more bad guys to beat up. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, flood the screen with bad guys. Like, uh, that, I think, is key. Um, and maybe, like, introduce some things that they introduced in other beat-em-ups, like um, uh, Scott Pilgrim, like the shop, like that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, like, was really like cool. a challenge mode, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, like something to collect, something that you can kind of gather and then use that to like level up your character or maybe like a Knights of the Round kind of style. Exactly. That'd be really cool. So I, I feel like Final Fight is great, but it could be so much better. Sure. And the fact that they haven't done anything with the franchise has just been dead in the water. Yeah. So The yeah. other thing I just thought of, you remember Battle Chess? On the NES, I've never played. It's kind of like a regular it. chess game. Okay. However, when you take another piece, you see kind of a cinematic of a battle happening. Okay. It's like sometimes they're funny, sometimes kind they're kind of neat. gory and serious. Yeah. It would be really cool if they had, you know, like next gen graphics and different types of like battles that happen every time another player takes something. Mm. Or you could like get DLCs that completely change the look. Like they could be cartoony characters. Yeah. Or if it's on like the Switch, they could be, you know, Mario chess players. Hmm. Maybe have some sort of interactivity with the battles to kind of neat. change the outcome of the game. Yeah. I would really like to see something like that because I think chess is something that a lot of people should get into that don't. Yeah, And chess that would awesome. probably help people get into that, that game a lot. Yeah, definitely. So... Cool. Yeah, Battle Chess 2018. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. the rights holder is, <laughs> if you're listening. Yes. <laughs> What's next? Uh, just a quick question from uh, Ben Dishman, otherwise known as The Dyad. Yes. Uh, he asks if the new release schedule has been helping us going uh, to a monthly show. Yeah. I mean, I would say right now it's it's good for me because I'm able to put out more personal content on my channel. So I'm able to focus on like, dude, you haven't played this game, and uh, you know, gaming linguistics, which I just put out two episodes for that, and uh, you know, it, it, it's it's kind of reinvigorated my spirit to put out more content like that, and uh, at the same time, it's left me with enough breathing room that I don't feel panicked. That I, I always try to work on one thing at a time. So like, if I'm working on Pixel Tunes while I'm working on Dude, You Haven't Played This Game, it can get very hectic. Hmm. So this kind of makes it a little bit more spread out, so that way I can kind of work on both projects. Keep your at focus the same going. Time. Yeah, pretty much, and it leaves me open to spend more time with my wife, and you know, that's always a good thing yeah, too. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, and same, I know you've, you've got stuff going on as far as what you're doing too. Yeah, right? same same here, you know, it's it's a lot easier for me to have more family time and kind of do the show at my own pace and not feel so rushed and trying to get it out by the end of the, uh, you know, it, I had a lot of drive time with my last job. I, mm -hmm. I had to drive sometimes more than an hour to and from work each way. And so I would have time to like listen to the show in the car and like, you know, tweak things. And now my drive is like seven minutes or less. Yeah. So it's a lot harder for me to like get in there and really listen and, and, and make sure everything is working properly. So now with this extra time, I can listen on my lunch breaks. I can, you know, kind of make sure the show is good before I put mm -hmm. it out and it's right. really helped me kind of do that stuff so cool. I'm hoping I'm still putting out the same amount of quality even though I have less time to, to kind of do that mm -hmm. that listening and uh, verifying stuff and like I said there's maybe some other stuff for me coming up in the future that's outside of Pixel Tunes Radio and that's giving me more time to uh, focus on that kind of develop uh, other content that I might be putting out on my own mm -hmm. so um, stay tuned for that and uh, yeah thanks Ben because that that was a cool question. Yeah, but. definitely. Always nice when people are like, how are you doing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not like, concerned. give me more music. I want right. more. So we got a <laughs> double question from okay. Josh Batten. We'll uh, not go too in detail because I know we're going a little long here. Yeah. Uh, so his first question, he says, hi, Ed and Mike. 
Uh, Jay Bats, Josh here from the What If Podcast. I have a question or two. So the first question is, since Marvel movies have been killing it in the box office for around a decade, but before that had been historically bad, and with the new Tomb Raider looking like not a pile of crap, do you think video games are primed to do the same? Ooh. Video game movies. Uh, I'm gonna say no. I think that video games don't have what it takes to do that because video games are just, they they change too much. And they don't have, in my opinion, enough lore and history to warrant, they don't have the same kind of readership or like, the players I don't think would be able to transition that experience into a movie. It's so difficult to make a movie hmm. And takes so much time and effort, and and I just think that video games are more about flashy experiences. Yeah. And I think that if you want to make a really solid movie, you can do it. It's been done. Like Prince of Persia was phenomenal. Right. R- very underrated video game movie. Mortal Kombat was a lot of fun. It was a great popcorn flick. The first Tomb Raider was excellent. I think there's better video game movies that are about like a broad topic of video games, like Wreck It Ralph. Which is phenomenal. Yeah. And Ready Player One looks really cool. Stuff like that. Yeah. But I don't think... There's like movies about video games right. rather than... Yeah, yeah. Video like, game culture. Right. Like, I don't think you could take, like, you know, Super Ghouls and Ghosts and make it into a, a movie. Yeah. Like, you just... You know, I, I think, wish. <laughs> because I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, the Castlevania Netflix series and how they're getting that very right. Right. And that, you know, something like that could be condensed into kind of a movie and, and do well. Yeah. So, I don't know. I have kind of mixed feelings. You know, anything could be crap or anything could be awesome. Really sure. depends on the hands of the yeah. people that are doing it. Absolutely. Um, the guys doing the Castlevania series are huge Castlevania fans already. And right. that, that's a big part of it. Yeah. Um, like the first Silent Hill movie was decent. It yeah. really got the feel of Silent Hill. But then the second one was utter crap really? because mm. it was just kind of a cash-in. Mm. So... That's that, that's really key. You bring up a good point. I feel like the special effects definitely will help get those movies along. Mm-hmm. I think I've heard rumors of a Mario movie. Yeah, I've heard about that. Uh, but that is CGI, yep. which is perfect. Sonic I, movie, too. I There's do not Sonic want movie. a live-action Mario movie or a live-action Sonic movie. Like, that would kill it. They're going to have Vin Diesel as Sonic. But I feel like an animated <laughs> or a CG feature-length film by yeah. a big company based on a video game would have mm-hmm. a much better chance at success mm. than uh, adapting something into live-action. Unless maybe it was like The Last of Us. Mm. Or like Uncharted doing, or something like that. They're doing that Rampage movie. And it's the, like with the rock. With the yeah. rock. And it's like it doesn't look anything like no, Rampage. It's just like a like a we were gonna make a Godzilla type movie and right. decided to slap the Rampage exactly. label on it. Yeah. So and that's that's you know, you have to be able to look at a movie and say either A, this was done as a labor of love, they're really catering to the fans, or B, we're gonna slap a name on here and hope that it draws the audience in just based on the name and not on the content. So, right. Good question, Josh. Thank you very much. Uh, what's his second question? Second question. Do you agree with companies like Limited Run Games bringing classic games to modern consoles, or do you feel this cheapens the classic gaming experience? For example, playing Night Trap with a PlayStation 4 controller feels fundamentally different than with a Sega controller, or that it feels weird to play older games on a modern console. And if you do agree, should these revamps consist of straight ports or should they be HD remakes with new assets, music, and sounds to bring them up to date? Love the show, guys. Keep the tunes pixelated and continue the great work. Thank you. I own a few limited run games. The thing is, is that limited run serves a purpose in the sense that th- the reason why limited run games exist is so that you don't have to worry about in the future if a game ever gets delisted, that if you didn't buy it at that time to re-download it, you'll be able to get the game. Yeah. Like, you pop it in your hard drive or your console, start downloading it, play it right from there, you're good to go. So that is the reason why limited run games exist, in my opinion. As far as uh, Night Trap, as your example, Night Trap is, in my opinion, a better game now than it was originally on the Sega CD. Absolutely. And, and there's a number of reasons for that that we don't have time to get into, mainly the fact that you can see everything. Whereas beforehand, you couldn't see, you only had one monitor to focus on now. Just like I was saying before, this is kind of how the developers wanted to do it, but had technical limitations. Now you can get exactly what they were going for. I personally would much rather play a game that has, you know, all new content, all new features, 
uh, but stays true to the core experience uh, from the original release. Perfect example is Wild Guns Reloaded. Mm -hmm. That's an example of a great re-release of a game and it added in new content, new music, like with the original composer, hello, yeah. like that's awesome. Yeah. So I, I think that Limited Run Games does a great thing in terms of serving a purpose for providing physical games to collectors. I, I just think that they, they struggle. I think they've become too big and that the companies remain small so they don't have the capacity to be able to serve a larger yeah. audience. Ironic that a company called Limited Run Games is like getting too big for right. their riches. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh well, so let's get into our show. So Isometric Gaming is the name of the game today. We're doing uh, the Isometric Gaming graphical style which we'll talk very briefly about. So it's similar to a top-down visual style. Uh, kind of like Zelda, but more like shifted on its side. So the X, Y, and Z axis planes are all at approximately about 120 degrees between each other. And this was in a way designed to create an almost 3D effect so the gamers could see things on a non-flat layout. And it's often cited as looking top down but from a specific corner of a room so that way you could see all the scenery and all the characters and all the items, etc, etc. Yeah. In layman's terms, if you're picturing a cube, Yep. And you uh, go a little bit above the cube, and then you point the cube so that you're looking directly down onto the like the front corner of the cube, so that you've got one of the corner edges straight up and down in front of you, and you see the cube at a diagonal perspective. That's more or less isometric yep. perspective. So that is uh, games like SimCity or uh, Desert Strike, Urban yep. Strike, those, those kind of games. Uh, Civilization, like Age of Empires, those are all isometric so that, that if you can picture those games in your head uh that's the kind of game that we are talking about exactly. today yes so ed's got first pick this time around what do you got for us yeah we're starting it off super old school today so let's get started with the track central park from last ninja 2 this is a commodore 64 game that came out in 1988 the composer is matt gray let's take a listen Thank you. 
All right, clocking in at almost six minutes long. That was Central Park by Matt Gray from the game Last Ninja 2, released on the Commodore 64 in 1988. It was kind of a Sid Chip opus there. Last Ninja 2, it's like, it's very ubiquitous. It's like uh, Final Fantasy. Mm hmm. <laughs> oh, you mean like like two? Yes. Like, how could you be the second last ninja? <laughs> <laughs> It'd be second to last ninja. I don't know. Uh, th- this track was awesome. Uh, the one thing I would say is that the biggest problem that I thought that it has is that it never ends, but it makes you feel like it's ending. It's like the Lord of the Rings: Return of the King. There's like a slower part in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah. And then it kind of goes into that. You're like, uh, oh, man, that was such a great movie. Wait, there's 30 minutes more. Like know. that's that's kind of <laughs> the vibe that I got. It, but hey, there's nothing wrong with that. It's you know more of a good thing. So yeah, it's not yeah. like you know. I felt like uh, he borrowed a lot from Rob Hubbard. I felt like there's a lot of uh, skater die yeah. in there. Like that mm-hmm. same kind of trill there was was very skater die. But it also felt kind of Tim Fallon esque in that it had lots of different parts and went through different movements, mm-hmm. slowed down and sped up. Um, some great guitar solo, like finger picking parts in mm-hmm. there. Even the drums were just kind of like there and banging along, but felt like very it really plotting. yeah. But yeah. it all it all kind of blended very very well together. Mm. This soundtrack is probably one of the most uh, well known and well loved soundtracks for the Commodore 64 and the game as well. So you look up this music on YouTube and you'll find. People who have covered it, remixed it, guitar covers, drum covers, you name, you name it. it. Yeah. Uh, Europeans probably have the song drilled into their head. Mm-hmm. The game sold like 5.5 million copies back in the day. Wow. Uh, at a point where the Commodore 64 had a 20 million person user base. So that means one out of every four people owned Last Ninja yeah, 2, 25% yeah. of the user base. Wow. Kind of like the Super Mario Brothers of, right. of the Commodore 64. Yeah. Really popular game, really popular soundtrack. Matt Gray uh, started off composing on the Commodore 64, and then he went on later to do remixes of this soundtrack and re-releases, and I think he had a Kickstarter uh, for a project called Reformation, which was kind of a uh, updating of the and remixed soundtrack for Last mm-hmm. Ninja and some of his other Commodore 64 compositions, uh, and you know that was successfully funded as well. After composing for the Commodore 64 games, uh, like Last Ninja 2 and Driller, he became a dance music producer and remixer under various aliases before co-founding Motivate and Xenomania, which were two of his his record labels. Mm. In 2016, Matt released the 50-plus track box set called Reformation Last Ninja 2 Remakes to great acclaim, and then a sequel uh, called Reformation 2, another box set, is going to be coming out sometime in 2018 this year. Cool. So this... This game and this soundtrack has a legacy that reaches 30 years now. So they're yeah. probably timing, you know, this this Reformation 2 release for the 30th anniversary of Last Ninja 2. Um, even the year after Last Ninja 2 came out, there was a game called Last Ninja 2 Remix, which included s- s- kind of like updated graphics for the game and then also remixed versions of the soundtrack. Mm. So it's like, wow, you know, this music is, is just kind of... Uh, everywhere <laughs> yeah definitely I'm, I'm sure our european listeners will be very well uh, aware of this track. yeah quite familiar yeah. to most of them and the game of course is an isometric perspective you play as uh, a ninja and you are kind of uh, it's kind of like exploration slash beat em up so you're fighting other ninjas uh, you're running around looking for items and then trying to find your way to the exit of the level. Mm. So it's 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 fun. I mean, for a Commodore 64 game, it was very well done. It improved a lot on kind of like the stiffness of the original The Last Ninja game. Uh, so the sequel kind of took it. And obviously by the sales numbers, you can tell that word mm. of mouth probably got out about how good it was. Yeah, I've played the first one and it's very stiff. Yeah. It's very rigid, very like tough to move around right so and by today's standards last ninja 2 will probably feel stiff mm. but it's a commodore 64 game sure. you kind of have to put yourself back in that 1988 mindset absolutely and, uh, yeah you know compare it to other games of its ilk it's tough to do that sometimes yeah <laughs> especially exactly. with the modern games that have come out uh, nowadays for sure Word. so i've been trying to find a way to put this i think this was like a backup soundtrack from like our ninjas episode oh, wow. way 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 back in the day okay and i was trying to find a way to kind of work this soundtrack into uh into an episode and isometric kind of fit perfectly so that makes sense here it is cool let's move on to the next one yeah so i've got biker mice from mars a super nes 1994 release the track is called fortress 
and it's by Nobuyuki Akina and Hideto Inoue. Welcome back! Put your heads back in your sockets. I don't know, your neck sockets. <laughs> that was Biker Mice from Mars. Uh, that is a racing game by Konami, and it came out in 1994. The track is called Fortress, and it's by Nobuyuki Akina and Hideto Inoue. So, yeah. Uh, this kind of furthers your um, Mega Man X soundtrack love, I, I think. I do agree. This does sound like if Konami wrote a Capcom game, like a Mega Man Yeah, game, exactly, like X2 or something. Definitely. It's it's rocking, very Judas Priest style, uh, with a little bit of like progressive metal flair there, with those uh, like Hammond organs that kind of float in, mm -hmm. which I was really digging. So it's just a really shreddy track. I, I dig it. This game is really cool. You've, have you played this game? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a, as I said, it's like a futuristic racing game kind of style, but you're like racing motorcycles. The whole point of Biker Mice from Mars is kind of like a TMNT ripoff a little bit. You could pick from one of six different racers. You've got uh, Moto, Throttle, and Vinny. Uh, <laughs> one of these things is not like the other. Yeah, right. Then you've got Lawrence Limburger, uh, Grease Pit, or Dr. Carbuncle. And uh, the maps themselves for the races are all isometric, and you got to kind of like dodge oil and different like uh, yeah, kind of like RC Pro Am too. Yeah, a little where bit. You've got a you know a, a, a isometric race course with yep. jumps, and uh, so if you kind of imagine RC Pro Am two mixed with um, rock and roll racing, yeah, it's very similar to that yep. style, like a battle yeah. uh, racing game. In like the non two player like story mode, you've got to like collect money. And uh, you get like prize money for for beating the racers, and uh, losers have to start over. So it's, right, it's, right. it's pretty cool. And you can use uh, the money to upgrade your bike, and yep. get better weapons, yeah, and different more tires and, and, and different like weapons and stuff. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, you go to the last chance garage to do that. So and as a Konami game, it's it's really well done. Yeah. You know, it's just like all of Konami's stuff back then. It, it feels like it was maybe done by some of the same development team that worked on like you know uh, Turtles in Time or yeah. something like that. The graphics are very similar. Yeah, my only complaint, and this is a common complaint, is that there's not really any kind of voiceover work. Which mm. I mean, like if you play like Turtles in Time, there's all like crazy voices and you don't really have any of that in this game unfortunately so you know but the yeah. soundtrack more than makes up for it uh interestingly enough the pal version of the game if you play that there's like all sorts of like snickers advertisements interesting like all over the place huh yeah so it's kind of funny yeah must have gotten some extra <laughs> monetary boost to release yeah. it over there or something hey you know you you want to put your bike of mice game out you can do that but uh how's about you uh Throw some Snickers my way, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't know why they're like Italian, like uh, like a uh, mobster. I, like... I would have done the English accent if yeah. it was Pal territory. Yeah. I mean, but you know, like <laughs> Pal was in Italy too, so yeah, sure, right. We'll yeah. go with that. That works. Uh, <laughs> so the composers, uh, Nobuyuki Akina has worked on a lot of Konami stuff. He was not Italian. Yes, no, definitely not. Pop and Twinby was the first game that uh, he worked on. Uh, worked on some of the Ganbare Goemon games, 2 and 3, as well as Akira Kira Doshu, Power Wrestling 96, a game called Fantastic Journey, Deadly Arts, and Hybrid Heaven. He was on the sound team for that. Uh, his last game was Castlevania Harmony of Despair in 2010. He was one of the musicians on that. Neat. And then Hideto Inoue really only worked on a couple games, mostly most of the same type of stuff. Um, you mentioned Turtles. Probably one of the reasons why uh, Turtles sounds so familiar is because he was a sound designer on the original NES Turtles game. 
Turtles Hyperstone Heist, Buster's Hidden Treasure for Tiny Toons, and TMNT Tournament Fighters in 93. Yeah, a lot of those high-profile Konami games. Definitely. Sunset Riders, Rocket Knight Adventures, he was sound program on. Uh, his last game, and by the way, he was also on the Hybrid Heaven as well, part of the sound team for that. His last game was International Superstar Soccer in 2000. Uh, but he's done some programming here and there for the MLB Power Pro series, too. Cool. So good stuff. I dig it. Excellent. Yeah. Now, <laughs> you've got, uh, you've got a, li- a laundry list of composers coming your way for you. Yeah, your well, track. okay. So uh, next track coming up is called Guild Hideout. This is from Lunar Knights, which was a game on the DS that came out in 2007. Uh, also a Konami game, coincidentally. Mm-hmm. Uh, the composers on this one, well, at least the sound team on this one, is Hiroe Noguchi, Masashi Watanabe, Masanori Akita, Akihiro Honda, Shiuichi Koburi, Nobuko Toda, Yuichi Tsushia, Yasuhiro Ichihashi, Tsutomo Watanabe, Tomoharu Nakano, Rie Yamatani, Itaka Shamoyama, Rie Nakano, Hideyuki Suzuki, and Kazuki Morohoka. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. You nailed that I don't first know try. How many hands fit on that keyboard at the same time? Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, wow. So, anyways, let's take a listen to Guild Hideout. Welcome back. That was a groovy jam. That was Guild Hideout from Lunar Nights, a DS game released in 2007, composed by all the composers I mentioned before the song started. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that, that was the sound team. We'll get a little more specific in a minute. Right. But uh, so that was a basically the fourth game in the Boktai series. Yes. And if all Guild Hideouts sound like this, then they must just be hiding out to have a good time because this mm-hmm. is a straight up jam. Yeah, this was awesome. I really was impressed by the instrumentation. It's very specific. Like you've got those the pan flutes, and you've got the uh, the slap bass or it's the, very, the like, upright bass, jazz, the fretless bass. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. and I love the combination of the fretless bass line and those like hip hop sampled style mm-hmm. drums. Even though it's all sequenced, it's made to sound like it was like sampled from a record. Yeah, uh, really cool sound. And then you've got all those those jazz and swing horns over the top of it. It's almost got like a fuzz to the sound. It's almost like yeah. it's playing off of a record. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. So I feel like you know maybe this guild is is like a very like a bunch of really like cool cats. Like I don't <laughs> I don't I don't know. I haven't played the game myself. Yeah. So, but that's the impression. Like if I walked into an area. Uh, I called a hideout, and I heard this. I wouldn't picture something like that. You know that bar from like um, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. Yeah. When they when they break into Annie, are you okay? Mm-hmm. You know that smooth criminal song. Yeah. Like that would be the kind of like bar this would be. Very smooth, smoky pool tables. Yeah. I was gonna say this goes very well with the Final Fantasy VII Turks theme. Oh, absolutely. Like just really cool. Yeah. You know, like yeah, lots of that. Baseline, just kind of carrying the whole tune along. Definitely, yeah. Little horns carrying the melody. It's good stuff. I, I was digging this track. Yep. And, and it's weird because I've played this game before for a very limited amount of time. Uh, I played the first Boktai game as well, and I thought it was really cool. The way the Boktai works, uh, it's a series that uh, Hideo Kojima has worked on for a no- he worked on for a number of years, 
And uh, the Box Eye series uh, originally was on the Game Boy Advance and had, I guess, three games. Uh, there was one game that... Uh, I think two got released in the U.S., yeah, and then one, one was, was Japan, Japan only. Exclusive, yeah. So, Boktai 1, The Sun is in Your Hand, is, is the more formal title of it. And, uh, y- you know, th- these games, these Game Boy Advance games, had actual sun sensors in them. And so they could tell when you were outdoors. And if you were outside, you would be able to use your, like... Uh, weapons, if I recall. Right. Um, and so, if not, then you would be facing off against enemies with um, different, like, skill sets, if you will. Um, so, the DS version kind of gets rid of all that uh, because there's no sensor in it. Yeah, so, to speak. so it has its own kind of weather yeah. uh, patterns built into the game. Yep. So, your gameplay will change and your powers will change depending on. Um, what your little you have, so you have kind of like a little weather station called the parasol, mm-hmm. and uh, depending on what type of so very much I guess kind of like Breath of the Wild, you know, yeah. you run into hot areas and cold areas, and um, so you would be able to do different things or have better resistance or or less resistance to the environment depending yeah. on what your weather was and how well you were equipped for that that uh. particular locale. I'm not familiar with the story really. Uh, bottom line is you're fighting vampires. That's really all you need to yes. know. And that's where that sun mechanic kind of fits in because you're fighting the enemies with sunlight, at least in the original Boktai games. And what's really cool about these games is that if you plug the Game Boy Advance games into like a DS Lite, then you can utilize them kind of almost like like amiibos in a way, yeah. in the sense that they give you additional features. You can charge um, up your character if you bring uh, the DS out into mm-hmm. the sun with yep. the Game Boy, with the with the Game Boy Advance game with the sensor. Super cool. Yeah. I mean, it utilized the microphone, which really not enough games did. Right. Uh, where you can it, it, like you blow into it and you can cause um, the character to, like uh, draw attention. Yep. Uh, for the enemies, so that way it gets them away from specific spots. So. And Hideo Kojima was great like that. You oh, know, yeah. he always, even with the original Metal Gear Solid, you know, like it would read the memory card in mm-hmm. slot two, and then you know the characters would interact with you depending on what what yep. saves you had on it. So you like Castlevania, yeah, don't you? He's really cool with with kind of exploiting those features yeah. that uh, different consoles have and, and building them into the game in, in new ways. So he definitely did that for Lunar Nights mm-hmm. as well. So pretty cool. Uh, yeah. A game worth checking out. It is an isometric perspective. Yeah. And uh, I heard it's pretty long and it's got pretty good reviews. So I might end up checking it out myself at some point. Especially if there's more music like this in the game. Oh, yeah. I listened to some of the soundtrack. A lot of it's very orchestral and didn't mm-hmm. really grab me too much. But then I just happened to hit upon this one and I was like, boom. Oh. Just from those first few notes with that fretless bass, those samples, I was like, I got to listen to the rest of this one. And <laughs> I did not regret it. Yes. So the so, composers. About What's all the these deal? composers, man, we got what happens in the game is that they list everybody who was on the sound team in kind of like one block. They don't mm. really specify who did what, who was a composer, who yeah. did sound effects, who did sound programming, who did sound direction. Uh, in looking through all of these composers and their other works, I kind of narrowed it down to Masanori Akita, Akihiro Honda, uh, Shuichi Kibori. Nobuko Toda and Yuichi Tsushia as probably the guys and gals who uh, did the composition work because they have other composition credits for other games. Mm -hmm. A lot of the other uh, names in this big list are uh, their other credits are only for sound effects or sound programming or sound direction, stuff like that. Mm. Most of them were Hideo Kojima, you know, team members. Uh, So, for instance, like Yuichi Tsuchiya worked on a lot of stuff for Konami, the PES uh, 2008, he did music composition for those soccer games. A little bit for Beat Mania 2 DX Ninth Style, uh, Ninja Turtles 3 Mutant Nightmare. He was one of these music composers and sound designers. Uh, Ninja Turtles 2 Battle Nexus. So all those Ninja Turtle Game Boy games, uh, kind of going back. He did a lot of the pop and music uh, soundtracks. Pop and music six, seven. Five and four. I don't know why I'm doing them out of order. <laughs> uh, and then Air Force Delta Storm. He also composed some music for uh, Nobuku Toda is uh, still composing to this day. Uh, the Evil Within 2, the game that just came out uh, last year, he did uh, orchestration and music production for that game. He worked a little bit as executive music producer on Halo 5 Forge. Hmm. Um, the original Evil Within, he did some arrangements for Super Smash Brothers. A music director on Killer is Dead composer on Lollipop Chainsaw, uh, PES 2011 and 2010, uh, and original music for Metal Gear Solid 4, so a lot of these Hideo Kojima games, uh, as well as some of the... I guess he left Konami probably around 
2010, because that's when he transitioned from Metal Gear Solid into Lollipop Chainsaw and Suda 51's games and stuff like that. Right, so, right. Um, Shuichi Kobori started off. Now he's a big time Konami and 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 Kojima dude. Um, started off with Threads of Fate and Kokobo Racing in 1999. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty in 2001. Uh, worked on some of the Boktai games. So Boktai, The Sun is in Your Hand in 2003. He was on the sound unit. And then Metal Gear Solid, Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater, Metal Gear Acid. Uh, then did Boktai 2 in 2004. Uh, Lunar Nights came out in 2007. So after that, PES 2009. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 4, Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. And then both Evil Within games as audio director in 2014 and 2017. <sighs> Akira <Wow>. Honda. <laughs> uh, mostly Metal Gear. I mean, he should be a familiar name for anybody who's into the Metal Gear games. Metal Gear Solid, Portable Ops, Subsistence, Snake Eater, uh, Twin Snakes, uh, Zone of the Enders. He worked on that as well in 2003. His latest games on 2014 he was lead composer on metal gear solid 5 and metal gear solid 5 the phantom pain he wrote the track sins of the father which i believe was the like main uh vocal track that they did all the trailers for etc etc hmm. uh, masanori akita again konami from beginning to end started off in 1999 with international superstar soccer uh, Ninja Turtles 2 Battle Nexus for the Game Boy. Castlevania The Dracula X Chronicles. He was the composer and arranger in 2007. So kind of like a late Konami composer. Yeah, he started yeah, yeah kind of later on in 99. Yep. Uh, his last game was the Yu-Gi-Oh! 5D's Wheelie Breakers game in 2009, which... <laughs> Wheelie Breakers. I know, which Yu-Gi-Oh! whatever, but that game actually has a really good soundtrack. Cool. It was worth checking out. So, yeah, uh, yeah. So that, I think, is enough composer Woof. jargon and game listing. Yeah. Let's move on to something a little more simple. Yeah, take a load off. What's then. coming up you, next? You deserve a break. You I know. Just, you deserve a pay raise for that. I need a that. Snickers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should play Biker Mice from Mars. Exactly. There you go. So the next game is Sonic 3D Blast. This is a Sega Genesis classic. 1996 was the year of release. This is Rusty Ruin Zone Act 1, and it's by Tatsuyuki Maeda, Jun Senue, Masaru... Setsumaru and Sairo Okamoto. Welcome back. That was Mr. Sonic 3D Blast. <laughs> what? <laughs> Mr. <Meester> Sonic. Mr. <laughs> it's a Sega Genesis game. Uh, came out in 1996. That was Rusty Ruin Zone Act 1. And it's by Tatsuyuki Maeda, Jun Senue, Masaru Setsumaru, and Seiru Okamoto. Uh, so, real quick about the tracks. Uh, most of the soundtrack, uh, like 24 tracks in total, 
Uh, most of it was composed by Jun Senue and Tatsuyuki Maeda. Masaru Setsumaro and Sairo Okamoto worked on the final boss and staff role themes. Gotcha. Okay. So, yeah, just throwing that out there. Uh, and interestingly enough, the Saturn version of this soundtrack is uh, composed or arranged, I guess you could say, by Richard Jakes. Yep. Yep. Very cool. So, yeah. This game is awesome. This is one of the first Sonic games. Uh, actually, to clarify, this is one of the first Sega Genesis games I ever owned. Hmm. Yeah. This was one of those games that I was like, I really don't have that much experience with Sonic. And I remember playing this on the Sonic... Uh, Mega Collection for the GameCube. Okay. That was that was a great collection. Yeah, it was that collection and Sonic Adventure 2. Those were the first two Sonic games. Oh, I'm sorry. And then Sonic Adventure 1 on Dreamcast. But other than that, I never owned any Genesis oh, so Sonic. You were a late bloomer. Oh, definitely. I mean, the Dreamcast was my first Sega system. Right. So, uh, I get th this game in Mega Collection. I'm like, this game is really cool. And I ended up finding it used somewhere and bought it and then later got rid of it got a complete in box version for like 10 bucks somewhere but this game is really great i mean it's an isometric viewpoint for sonic which hold slow your roll i know initially a lot of people <laughs> would hear that and be like ah 2d only but it's it's really cool for the way that the game itself works uh the whole point of the game is you're going around trying to rescue these uh, little birds called flickies right which are introduced in a later game called Flicky. And I think the Japanese title for this game was like Sonic and Flicky Land or something yeah. like that. Sonic 3D Flicky Island. It was, um, yeah, it was called Sonic 3D Flicky's Island. So really kind of hammering that home. Um, but yeah, the Flickies are these birds that are uh, being uh, captured by uh, Dr. Robotnik. And the whole point of each level is to go through and find all the Flickies. Uh, basically uh, kill enemies and then you take over the Flickies that were you know, kind of like being taken by those robots, those yeah. evil robots. Kind of a similar premise to the actual 2D Sonic games. So yeah. Kind of like turning bad guys into good guys kind and of. stuff like that. Except they stay behind you right. while you're running around. And that's when you around. have to collect enough of them yeah. to, to get to the end of the level and, and unlock that, that yeah. big tank at the end of the level. Um, so this was developed by Traveler's Tales, which yes. is interesting because it was a UK-based uh, development company, mm -hmm. but then Japanese composers kind of yeah. added the music in afterwards and I feel like I feel like it worked really well it did. because then you got this this great game by Traveler's Tales arguably great game by Traveler's Tales <laughs> um, but then you have this very sonic music yeah and this song feels very sonic because it starts off with that groove and then the groove kind of fades to the background a little bit and then the melody comes in over mm -hmm. it feels very much like the Sonic 2 music like they patterned it after a lot yep. of the stuff that, that came in those first two games Sonic 2, Sonic 3 I would even argue Sonic 3 since June Senaway worked on that yep. as well yep. I love those sample drums in the beginning that kind of kick off the song. Yeah. You know, after the mel main melody starts playing and then you get the, the like that really crunchy snappy sound yep. and then it kind of rolls into the normal drums that are kind of like you know going all throughout the entire track uh, so it's it's really interesting that they use those drums just initially just to kind of kick off the tracks so. yeah yeah but yeah it's it's really cool so um, uh, also we should probably talk about are, now are you Mike familiar yeah. with Game Hut the channel on YouTube. Yeah, you're talking about uh, that the lead programmer in this game, John Burton, right? You're, right. That's where you're going with Correct. this. Correct. So that's yeah. that's his channel. Mm -hmm. So he has a huge series of videos all about games that Traveler's Tales developed for Sega, uh, the the Mega Drive and Genesis, the mm -hmm. the Saturn. He really gets into Sonic 3D Blast and how they coded the game and how a lot of these special effects they've done. Uh, like he gives visual representations of how the Genesis actually pulls mm -hmm. a lot of these really cool bonus levels off and stuff. And not only that, but he made a patch for the Sonic 3D Blast ROM that's kind of like the director's cut. Right. So he cleaned up like the camera and a lot of the controls and a lot of things that uh, gamers had a lot of issues with when the game first came out mm -hmm. and kind of like almost perfected the game. Yeah. And so you can find that on the web patch, a ROM of the version that you have. And uh, and just play it on an emulator or an EverDrive or whatever, and kind of get not a remake, but like a better version of the right. original game. Kind of following up with um, what we were talking about at the beginning of the episode. Yeah, which which I played and it plays amazingly. It was really? fun as hell. Yeah. I didn't have much experience with the original one, so I didn't have much to compare it to. Hmm. But it felt like a very very solid. I didn't have any issues with controls or camera or any complaints that anybody had. That's cool. That I've read, so it's I'll definitely to, worth checking out. I'll have to check it out. I haven't played it yet. 
Um, but because I'm so familiar with the original, this will be a real treat to yeah, kind of check out. Exactly. It'd be I cool to like, ever drive dump, over at some point. We can, yeah, we can check it out. It'd be cool to dump that onto the original cart, like you know. Uh, Kind of update it, yeah. Yeah, update it. Yeah, I'm not sure if the cart, uh, if the new version of the game has more memory. Yeah, I, 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 it's possible that it could, but yeah. I don't know. You probably just have to replace the board and put the same shell around it. Yeah, most likely. But that'd be cool. So yeah, I, I dig, I dig everything about this game. I love the music overall. It's all really great stuff. Uh, so, as far as the composers go, uh, Sairo Okamoto worked on a bunch of Sega stuff, um, namely Skies of Arcadia, did sound effects for uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion in 96, uh, Sega Rally Championship in 95 did sound effects, mostly has done sound effects, uh, really only has a few music composition uh, credits, uh, one of which is Sonic Rush Adventure in 2007. Uh, as well as Sonic and the Secret Rings in 2007 and Fantasy Star Universe Ambition of the Illuminous in 2007. Uh, Masaru Setsumaru, again, worked on a lot of Sega stuff. Uh, we've talked about them in the past before. Uh, just to name a couple games, Nightshade uh, in 2003. Uh, Sonic Adventure DX, the director's cut, did sound effects. Uh, Panic in 1993, which I think we did on the... Sega CD, Sega CD episode. episode with my brother, yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, Sonic Jam did the compositions and arrangements for that. Valkyria Chronicles in 2008. And one more, uh, the Yakuza series did uh, 0, 5, 4, and 3 on that. Oh, you're going backwards too, huh? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> uh, Jin Sinue worked on a lot of Sonic stuff. Uh, pretty much the main Sonic composer since Sonic the Hedgehog 3, or at least a co-contributor of multiple, multiple Sonic soundtracks, yeah. pretty much. So uh, if there's been a Sonic game that's come out since Sonic 3, more or less Jun Senue has worked on it. And, Unless it's uh, been made by Bioware. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and Masaru Setsumaru worked on, again, uh, pretty much a good chunk of the uh, Yakuza series, all the ones that I mentioned prior. A uh, bunch of Sonic stuff, uh, Nightshade as well, Sonic Adventure DX Director's Cut, Gun Valkyrie in 2002 was the sound creator on that, Shinobi in 2002, that re-released game, the one on the PS2. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, tons and tons of stuff. Uh, it's been a Konami composer since Sonic Eraser in 1991, which uh, is also, it's very similar to Columns. I guess it features Sonic. I've never heard of it. Maybe it was Japan only? Maybe. Like European only? Or course. it never got released, who knows. So yeah, that's, that's Sonic 3D Blast for you. Great game, great soundtrack, good stuff all around. Very cool. Yeah. What do you got? You're going into the uh, more modern era with this next track. Yes. So I don't know if I'm cheating a little with this or not. I mean, this this game, uh, it's 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 isometric in a sense Ask. of uh, yeah, but the camera does rotate a bit while you're while you're playing. Okay. But your default perspective is kind of isometric. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, fantastic soundtrack. Uh, this is a track from the game Assault Android Cactus. Came out on just about everything: PS4, Xbox One, PC, Linux, Mac. Uh, back in the grand year of 2015. Uh, and this is composed by Jeff Van Dyke, who most of you guys might know as the composer of the lovely Skitchin soundtrack. So uh, let's take a listen to Cactus.
All right, that was Cactus from Jeff Van Dyke off the game Assault Android Cactus. Came out on the PS4, Xbox One, PC, Linux, Mac, and probably your car's dashboard in 2015. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, Very new age kind of style, like twist on like synth pop. Yeah, exactly. You know? Uh, very, very much follows the motif of this game. Everything is, you know, sci-fi, mechanical, mechanical enemies, mechanical protagonists. Uh, so all the music has, like, kind of a dubstep or a house or a trance kind of feel to it. Mm. Very, very textured. I love this soundtrack. It's right up my alley. Uh, every song feels very different, but has generally the same kind of atmosphere to it. Mm. Uh, it took me forever to figure out which song I actually wanted to put yeah, yeah, on the yeah. show. One of those kind of soundtracks. Uh, so I just figured that I'd go with Cactus because it's the uh, title screen music, title screen and menu music, and oh, it uh, is really yeah. That's really funny because I was going to ask you like, is this like menu or title screen music? Yeah, it yep. totally fits the bill. Exactly. Yeah. And the other ones, uh, they're they play mostly during the action sequences, and it's a twin stick shooter, so they're mm. very very frantic, very noisy. So they're kind of like right up my alley, but might not be something that every listener of the show might mm. appreciate so much. So. I kind of wanted to go with a more melodic, kind of a little more calmer uh, piece, which kind of exemplifies the kind of sound the game has. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, Jeff Van Dyke wrote this. A lot of people know him from Skitchin, but then kind of like nothing else. Mm. Uh, even though he's actually been active on a whole bunch still of games. Game. Still in the game. Yeah. So he originally was from Canada, and so he worked with uh, Electronic Arts' Canadian division. His first game ever was Skitchin. Uh, moved on to like Sled Storm, NHL Hockey, FIFA Soccer, uh, like the original N NHL and mm. FIFA games. Right. Uh, Need for Speed and Need for Speed 2, Tiger Woods PGA 4 2004. It's like before they did all like uh, uh, licensed music. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this was all like the, mostly the Mega Drive versions of the, of the games. Mm. Um, then moved on to stuff like Emperor, uh, Rise of the Middle Kingdom, Spartan Total Warrior, Medieval 2 Total War. Uh, the Total War series, I think he wrote the soundtracks for all of them, hmm. um, up to Total War Shogun 2, Fall of the Samurai. After that, he worked on Vega Conflict and then did this soundtrack, Assault Android Cactus. Uh, moved on to Alien Isolation, which he won a BAFTA oh, award wow. for. Cool. Yeah, that was a really good game with a really good sound design. He did all the sound design mm. for that game. And then Hand of Fate, Submerged, uh, the sequel Hand of Fate 2, and then his most recent game was Farts. I mean, Forts. <laughs> Uh, which came out last year, I think, something like that. So, uh, yeah, he's got his own website, jeffvandyke.com. You can go check out samples of mm. his work, kind of like, you know, his past history and stuff like that. So It's really cool to see a composer continue on throughout the years, and even though you only kind of knew them for one or two specific things, that they're still working to this day on game right. music. Right, well, kind of like John Baker. You yeah. know, it was like, he did... Toe Jam and Earl, and right. what else? But yeah, you, you know, yeah. we talked to him, and we find out he's done all these all really this cool stuff. games yeah. that and stuff that we might have heard, but not even known it was him. Yep. So yep. that's um, interesting. Yeah, really same cool. with Jeff Van Dyke. I, I think none of his other works sound anything like Skitchens. Right. So if, if that's all you know, that's kind of like the sound you might be looking for. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you're not going to see that in like a FIFA game or anything. Right. So he really had to change up his style. Um, so if you do go over to JeffVanDyke.com, you'll get links to his YouTube channel. Um, and I'm sure if you just search his name on YouTube, you'll be able to, to do that. And it's D Y C K. D Y C K. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so he's got dev diaries. So he actually will take you through how he composes music for some of his games. That's cool. Like Hand of Fate Two and stuff like that. Show little um, Sweet. demonstrations of him like playing the ukulele or the mandarin and you know different parts mm -hmm. of the song. So uh, he's really into it. And and I, I'd love to try to get him on the show at some point. So maybe yeah. we'll reach out to him and see. Yeah, sure. You know what he says. If if you guys do want us to talk to him, him. Let us know, you know, on our Facebook group. Yeah, let us know what you think of this track too. Yeah, absolutely. I was digging this track. I think it's pretty cool. This is definitely something that I would have totally listened to back in, you know, like 2004, 2005 era. Yeah, yeah. That was I was really big into listening to like anything synth pop. Yep. So like this would have been definitely something that you would have <laughs> been hearing on my stereo. Yeah, and I think you would enjoy this game too. And yeah. It came out on PS4, so you can totally grab Sweet. it. Uh, like I said, twin stick shooter. You get a lot of different characters. Um, they're all android girls, and they're all kind of very cartoony 
looking uh, like okay. chibi anime character style girls. Uh, but they all have different powers, different weapons. You've mm. got, you know, Cactus, who's your uh, kind of like main first character that you get. And then as you're going through this kind of like enemy space station to uh, destroy this kind of like boss core character that's kind of gone wild to regain the control of the space station, you rescue your other team members from the Assault Cactus group. And so you've got like uh, the nerdy one with like a slower missile launcher. You've got this kind of like half done android girl who's like completely crazy and talks in total nonsense <laughs> uh you've got the tank you know you've got the sprightly cheerleader type one that runs around uh with, this with a faster weapon reminds me a lot of like if jet force gemini was a twin stick shooter yeah okay like the graphical style on the characters it's very like yeah kind of chibi style but also very like American ish. Right, like American version of anime yeah, kind of deal. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty neat. Yeah. yeah I'll no, have to it's check a, this one out. It's a great game. I've had it on Steam forever. Um cool. and I've played all the way through it and loved it. So cool. definitely worth picking up. I will check it out. Hooray! Alright, let's go retro again. What you all got right. next for us? Yeah, I got an all time favorite of my own childhood memory. Snake rattle and roll on the NES in nineteen ninety was the year of release. This is levels 5 and 8 by Mr. David Wise. Little baby Mike playing with snakes. Yes. Wait, what? Gross. <laughs> That was Snake, Rattle, and Roll, and that was the NES version of that game. 1990 was the year of release, and that was levels 5 and 8 by Lord David Wise. Yeah, we talked about this game uh, back, what, episode 23, our yes. David Wise Spotlight yeah. episode. We played a track from that. We, we, we played level 3. Level 3. And what's really funny about it is uh, that is the original track that I picked was level 3, and then Ed was like, you can't play that. We already played that already in the David that, Wise man. episode. I was like, oh, man, but that's like my favorite track. It's a great track, too. It's it a very is. bouncy 50s, like, sock hop style yeah. track. And this whole soundtrack is kind of 50s yep. style. Uh, Dave Wise really went with a common theme for all of this soundtrack. Most of the tracks are, like, very, like, 12 bars blues-esque yeah. uh, from the original sh uh, Shake, Rattle, and Roll 1950s, you know, blues kind of sound this song though is just like straight up banjo yeah i mean like after sure. it kicks off with that you know da -na -na, da -na -na, and then it kind of like rolls into this like just like totally <laughs> like banjo i i picture david wise just like slamming his foot multiple times on the ground just like in tune with banjo playing yeah. just like frantically like wearing a straw hat with yeah. glass sticking out of his yeah mouth. just occasionally being like corn cup pipe yeah, yeah overalls yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love this game. This is one of my favorite, favorite childhood games. I loved it. I just, oh my god. I absolutely, I'm not really a big fan of this kind of game normally. Like, this is not something that I would normally play, like, nowadays. But, oh, man, I have so many memories of trying to beat this game. I still haven't beaten it to this day. I've gotten really far. I've gotten to, like, the, I don't know, sixth or seventh level I've heard it gets something. pretty hard, yeah. It, it, gets ridiculous like all those old rare games did yeah i mean so to give you the simple premise if you've never played it uh you're playing as one of two snakes it's a two-player game if you want it to be rattle or roll and uh you're going through up to 11 different levels all isometric style in terms of the graphics and uh, you're going around eating these things called nibbly pibblies. And interestingly enough... So freaking British. I had no idea what they were called. I always just thought they were like little balls. 
So I would always call them different colored balls, like red ball, blue ball, yellow ball. Snake balls. Yeah, snake balls, exactly. <laughs> but I had no clue that they were called Nibbly Pibblies, and you are absolutely right. That is such a British absolutely. name. <laughs> so you grab these guys with your tongue, with the... Wait, what? You grab, grab the nibbly pibblies. You grab the tongue. nibbly pibblies with your snake tongue. Your snakily wakily tongue. Your snakily wakily. Tongue-ly wongly. Yep, and then you eat eatily wheely them up. <laughs> and then it adds little like balls on your on your butt. It basically gives you like tail. Like a tail. You mean your bum. Your bum. We're, we're, oh sorry, we're, we're British, British today, yeah. Alright. So You're your bumly wumly. Your bumly wumly. <laughs> and so as you gain more of these, you gain in weight. And the whole point of the game is to get to the end of the level with enough weight so that when you step on the scale, it makes this like blah, 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 noise and then you can go in through the door. Exactly. And I remember the sound effects so vividly in this game, especially that ringing noise when you hit the uh, buzzer. And yeah. It's like blah, 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 blah. very distinct. And then you go in the tunnel like foo, 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 foo. and then then the score comes up and you've got this like intense sound that I've never heard on really like very few NES games, mostly rare games will play it. But it's like this, uh, it's like this. I feel like I'm weird... in Police Academy. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm like going very, uh, what's that character's name? Michael, um, Hightower? Hi- is Hightower? Is that it? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going with a lot of sound effects right now just because they're so vivid and they're so, they, they have such character to them. Right, yeah. And in a game that isn't really all about like super cool, awesome, badass characters this game just has a life of its own when it comes to the sound effects and the music too so yeah it's it's very similar to marble madness in a lot of different ways because when you're manipulating the snake over like certain areas and patches you can fall down into holes you can fall down into spikes it's just it's a brutal game it and the isometric perspective on this game allows that to happen much more easily because with that perspective it's a better way to do 3d in a sprite based 2d video game so you've got got to finagle your snake to get to where you need to go and some (laughs) i mean that's basically my teen years yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) but it's just so difficult to get to where you need to go so you'll see where you need to go and you'll be like okay i can get there but then you've got to jump up on all these different platforms to get there and you've got to kind of like manipulate your jumps so that you can go over certain things to get certain items there's some items that they put in these ridiculous places that you're like i'm never gonna get right there. like they're just they, teases they're you, like red hair yeah oh it's so annoying so but i i just so many awesome memories with this game love it cool great game all right Let's move on to yeah. our next track. Yeah, we don't need to talk about David Wise. We've talked about him. Yeah, just go check out episode 23 if yep. you want more information. We, we were pretty in-depth with him there. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of uh, composers that we've done shows yeah. on. <laughs> two shows, uh, Yeah, two shows. This yeah. one uh, is a track by Tim Fallon. This is the ending from Solstice, since we've already played the title track. This right. is uh, one of the best soundtracks from an isometric game, and I could not leave it out of the show. So this is the ending theme from Solstice for the NES. came out in 1990. Boom! And that was a quickie, but a goodie. That was the ending from Solstice, which came out on the NES in 1990, composed by the man, Timothy J. Fallon. I was going to say, it sounds like your sex life, but... 
ending? <laughs> no. And you were like, that was a quickie but a goodie oh, by Tim Fallon. Yeah, and well. I was like, yeah. You know, when you have kids, they all got to be quickies but goodies. <laughs> Especially featuring Tim Fallon. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's in my sandwich afterwards. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. So, uh, yeah, I mean, not many people play this track. I mean, everybody, I think the, the, the title theme to Solstice is like so amazing so that it kind of overshadows amazing, yeah. the rest of the soundtrack. And the rest of the soundtrack to this game is very ambient. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's not a lot to it. Especially, like, uh, the sequel Equinox has a very ambient soundtrack and is hardly even, like, suitable for podcasts really at all. Mm -hmm. But this ending track is just this nice little kind of hidden gem in the Fallen Collection. It's got kind of like a a 3-2 time signature going on there, but it's a nice little progressive rock style track. Very 70s kind of psychedelic feeling. Kansas and Pink Floyd. Yeah, that kind of a deal. You know, uh, yes. And he's so good at emulating those styles. Yep. Anything from like the seventies, like funk, disco, yeah, rock, yeah, yeah. he can he can make the NES do all of it and sound completely recognizable and amazing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and I like this because it has an like an actual ending too. It's not a loop, mm-hmm. and you get that nice little like triangle or a square wave bass, just kind of like right at the end. Yes, nice little ending to a very difficult and somewhat frustrating game yeah, for a lot tough. of people. Definitely, uh, this one was one of those games where you like you really need to make your own map. Uh, to figure out where things yeah. go uh, because you can fall through the floor at any point and end up on a level below you and it's very easy to get lost mm-hmm. so Definitely I haven't played walk it, walk yeah, through, yeah. I haven't played too much into this game myself just because I can't put the time and effort into orienting myself every time I make a mistake or something so. only we were all like 10 years old again because then we could play stuff like infinite this infinite amounts of time yes yep yeah Less you need to do like a freaky Friday with your son well not me you That'd be weird if I did that. Send my son to work? Yeah. And me go to second grade? Yeah. First grade? Yeah, why not? That'd be awesome. Sure. Yeah. I'd probably ace it. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, you gotta look into the sun and blink three times. I just have to remember my vowel sounds. Yeah. That's how you get in, in, in and out. You just look at the sun and blink three times. Oh, really? Yeah, and that's oh, how you... But your son has to do it, too. But well, how do I know which sun I'm going to end up in? You have to I be... don't want to get into Eddie's head, because yeah. I'll have to play first-person shooters all Right, day. right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you can play whatever you want. Fair so enough. He would still come home. He'd be you, so he would come home and just be like, all right, I'm going to play shooters. Yeah. And then your wife would be totally confused, because... Eddie would be playing like you know Solstice, yeah, and, and you'd be playing <laughs> <laughs> sh- sh- oh, shooters. This is very strange this thinking is, about this. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, uh, Solstice <laughs> is not necessarily a game I recommend, but it's definitely a soundtrack I recommend. Uh, anybody who's listened to the show in the past doesn't need to hear me drone on and on about the lovely Tim Fallon. Whoa, whoa! You like Tim Fallon? Uh, yes. I would have never known. Yes, I believe I've done about. <laughs> Five hours worth of podcasting based on him alone. Yeah, close to it. Not yeah. counting the individual songs I've right. played in other. But it's nice because see, I was I was saving up all my Tim Fallon songs for those two shows, mm. and now that I've done those two shows, which spanned his entire career, right? Now I can start throwing in little songs of his here and there, yes. and, and and get people kind of into the the more obscure stuff and not the stuff that's like the really standout right. stuff, which right. is all good as well. So. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so that's that's Solstice, uh, one of the most frustrating isometric games on the NES. <laughs> Why don't we go on to one of the least frustrating isometric games on the Super Nintendo? Yeah, this is an interesting little number and one that I would have never picked from normally. So uh, <laughs> this this theme worked perfectly for yeah. this. This is Super Mario RPG: Legend of the Seven Stars. Came out in 1996 on the Super NES. This is Rose Town, and it's by Yoko Shimomura.
Alright, welcome back! That little ditty was Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. That was the Super NES release in 1996. That was Rose Town, and that was by Yoko Shimomura. It's funny, because it kind of feels like it uses a lot of the same instrument sounds that uh, the Lunar Nights track did, mm. but in a very different way. This yeah. is much more playful, much more Nintendo. Oh, yeah. You know, the drums are much softer and kind of like brush sticks mm -hmm. uh, instead of that kind of harder hip-hop beat. But you got that fretless bass sample on the background. You've got probably more like an oboe than a pan flute, but yeah. you've got some horns going on there at the same time. So uh, this is a very Nintendo track, for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. It's just, it, it's got such a warm, vibrant feel to it, but it also has that bouncy, like... I wouldn't quite say like sock hop, but yeah. kind of like a Mario World feel. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, all the music in the in these games, in particular the Paper Mario series, just has really great music. But in particular, this Mario RPG game really kind of set the tone for uh, the rest of the franchise. And uh, you know, it's a shame because this was a really great game that Square Soft at the time and Nintendo both worked on together. So it was developed by Square, published by Nintendo, but it, it just felt like such a great joint effort by the two companies. And we really haven't seen anything like this in the Mario RPG series. Like a lot of the games later on, Nintendo knew that they needed to continue with a Mario RPG style, but they never really got back to this game yeah in my opinion like and, and even some of the characters that he introduced in this game like mallow and gino and the, even like the the enemies the antagonist uh, smithy who's like the main boss the whole game starts off like a regular mario game where like mario goes to save the princess from bowser and then ends up where bowser gets flung you know somewhere off in the distance the princess gets flung off somewhere in the distance and mario as well but uh, Mario sees like Smithy or whatever this giant sword that's like shoved into the castle that Bowser was at and so it, you go off on this journey and you get all these heroes with you and you're you end up being on the same team with Bowser and Princess Toadstool for the first time yeah so it's it's a really really great experience if you haven't played this one and you like Mario games but you also like RPGs you'll love it uh, the whole game is isometric, of course, mm -hmm. but when it comes to gameplay, there's a lot of elements that, that make it more of an action game than an RPG in a lot of ways. Like the way that you do attacks. So you'll choose to do an action or an attack, and you'll start jumping on the character, and you can press the button to time it. And it's funny because this game made me do that in other RPGs. Right. This kind of set the standard for that. A lot yeah. of RPGs. And I, I think they felt that it, it gives you that kind of interaction mm -hmm. uh, and a little bit more of a, you know, you decide the outcome of your yeah. of your battle. So, and I know that, you know, the Mario and Luigi games on the DS, like Bowser's Inside Story right. and all that, they also kind of implement that. Uh, Mother 3 as well, which is another Nintendo RPG. Mm -hmm. They have a mechanic where when you're hitting an enemy, you have to press the button yep. uh, to the beat of the song that's playing in the background to get yeah. more and, and, and higher powered hits. That's so cool. yeah. uh, this, this kind of set the precedent for that. Definitely. Yeah. So Yoko Shimomura has been working on games way since way back when, uh, working initially for Capcom with Final Fight, the original arcade version in 1989. And then later doing the Super NES version in 1990. Street uh, Fighter 2. Street Fighter 2, Codename Viper, Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition, Turbo Edition, you name it, pretty much any version of that soundtrack. We're going to talk about her a little bit later, so I don't want to dive too deep into her initially. Whoa. That sounded wrong. <laughs> so... Uh, just a great game, great soundtrack, and great story as well. You know, you don't expect much story normally from a Mario game. It's like, you know, save the princess, and then she's like, I bet you cake! Right, you yeah. Know? I don't know why she has that voice. <laughs> Hi! That's your best Peach voice, I yeah. guess. I don't know, but, you know, being an RPG and with Square's writers on board, mm -hmm. you're going to have more of a That's deep storyline. You, yeah. you can't really have an RPG without a storyline, because... Yeah, you need characters you know. to care about. Right, You know, exactly. and if you don't have that, then what's the point? Yeah, you know? so. all those random battles will turn you right off if you're not yeah. in it for something. And with such dynamic battles as well, it, it really fits with the tone of the music too. So yeah. there's great characters, great story. Can't recommend this game enough. Go play it if you haven't already. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, fine. Well, then, what you got for me? All right, so rolling from Nintendo's iconic character to Namco's iconic character, uh, this is Pac-Mania, which was kind of like an isometric take on the Pac-Man series. Mm -hmm. This track is called Pac-Man's Park. This is the arcade version of the game that came out in 1987, written by Junko Ozawa, Yoshito Tomuro, and Yoriko Keino. Waka waka waka, that was Pac-Mania. The track was called Pac-Man's Park, and that came out on the arcade in 1987. This was composed by Junko Ozawa, Yoshito Tomuro, and Yoriko Keino. I don't know, I feel like this track has like multiple personalities. Because you start off and yeah. it's got like a very Blues Brothers, dun 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 dun, mm-hmm. which kind of is a takeoff on the original Pac-Man arcade tune. And then uh, you get that, like, southern rock groove that comes in towards the end of it. I was going to say it sounds like Alice Cooper schools out. Okay. There's this part that's like, na, 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 yep. na. It's very, like, no more homework. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. Uh, I, I got that little sing-songy vibe from, <laughs> from that. I don't know why that popped into my head, but I heard this and immediately thought of Alice Cooper. So No, that's I can, I can kind of see that, definitely. Yeah. I don't yeah. really think in the rock terms like that. Sure, but yeah. sure. But it's it's a fun little FM track. I was very arcade. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is interesting because this particular arcade machine that Namco put out uses the YM2151 chip, which is the same chip that's in the Sharp X68000. And um, so the Sharp X68000 port of this game has an identical soundtrack. They just literally just put uh, it, you know, same chip. They just ported it right over. Hmm. So it's kind of cool to have uh, like a true arcade soundtrack on a home system at this day and age because yeah. usually you would always get kind of like a watered down version of the music true uh, i'm sure gamers at that time maybe didn't care so much but it's cool yeah. to have it now or pac mania is basically kind of like pac-man but it's isometric and i think there's some jumping mechanics involved where yeah. you can kind of leap over the walls and stuff uh some of the i think this particular one pac-man's park looks kind of like legos yes uh, if i remember correctly yep and uh it's just ghosts chasing you around uh, there's not too much to say about it. It's just a fun little arcade game with some really good graphics for its time, especially yeah. for 1987. They looked almost 16-bit. Yeah, you know, that, yeah. That very realistic kind of a perspective that you've got. Well, that isometric thing really helps add to that style. Yeah. It, that's the thing about isometric games is it makes it that much more advanced looking because you can see so much. Right. So it really does give like a, it, it almost like bumps it up to next level graphics. Yeah. It's like, so for developers that wanted to make polygonal games when polygons didn't exist, you right. know, that you had to go isometric to mm-hmm. give it that kind of perspective. Uh, a little bit on the composers, Junko Ozawa. Uh, she was mainly a Namco composer. Started off way back in 1984 with Gap Plus on the arcade, uh, Tower of Druaga for the arcade, a lot of arcade games, Sky Kid, Dig Dug 2, Battle City on the Famicom, The Return of Ishtar on the arcade, and then later on did some home releases for the NES like Sky Kid. After Pac-Mania in the arcade, stuff like Family Jockey and Family Tennis for the Famicom. 
Rolling Thunder on the C64. Uh, she was the... Well, I don't think she was the composer for the C64 version. She must have been... Arranger. The original yeah. version, and then other people arranged it for the C64. But Rolling Thunder on the NES, RBI Baseball 2 on the NES, uh, Pac-Man 2 The New Adventures on the Genesis, uh, and then 2003 The Tower of Juaga, the GameCube version. She composed the soundtrack hmm. to that as well. Yoshi 2 Tomorrow, uh, aside from uh, the Pac-Mania game, there's not too much else I see uh, that they're credited for except some music for the Fire Emblem series. The original mm. Fire Emblem. Uh, other than that, it's really hard to kind of track them down. Like a ninja. Oof. Like a ninja into the night. And Yuriko Keino, also a Namco stalwart. She started off in 1982 in the arcade version of Dig Dug and Xevious and Fozon, a lot of those really groundbreaking Namco arcade machines. Mm. After around 1984, did the uh, soundtrack for Xevious on the NES, and then uh, a lot of the Dig Dug titles for the arcade and Famicom Dig Dug 2, and then the uh, Famicom version of Dig Dug. After Pac-Mania came out in 1987, uh, she did World Stadium for the arcade and Rompers on the arcade. That was in 1989. <laughs> Rompers? Rompers. After that, don't have much information on her. Ninja. But so these were a lot of the very classic Namco composers that really kind of built formed that. Namco's, Namco's sound, sound. Yep. Uh, both on the FM and some of the PSG chips and the uh, the NES and their arcade machines. So this is kind of a little piece of history of the soundtrack right here. Cool. Yeah, I mean you you'd think that they'd put their big name composers on a Pac-Man game, right. of course, because Pac-Man's one of Namco's biggest money makers back in the day. Yeah, Namco has a very Big history. I'd like to go over it sometime. You know, like in an episode. Sure. Yeah, that'd, that'd be, be cool. a great show. Yeah. I would get to play Ridge Racer. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to a game I am very, very familiar with. <laughs> uh, this is Battle Chasers Night War on the PlayStation 4. This came out in 2017, and this track in particular is by Clark Powell. Jesper Kid also did some music on it. I would have picked a Jesper Kid track myself. Well, yeah, but you'll see once we start getting into the soundtrack itself and all the nitty-gritty details. This track is called Mana Surge, so let's let's give it a little listen. Right on. That was Battle Chasers Night War, the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and soon to be Switch release, as well as Steam. And that was 2017's release. 
And that was Mana Surge by Clark Powell. Again, also additional music by Jesper Kidd. Uh, the reason I, I kind of mentioned Jesper Kidd is it, it, it's very hard to determine who did what when you listen to the soundtrack because it all blends so well. It's got this like orchestral, electronic, like techno vibe to it but it also has like a very organic feel mm. it's it's almost it's like pretty much kids modern stuff in a nutshell yeah i mean it's got those indie rock kind of elements as well with a lot of stuff it's very like folksy with a lot of just like simple guitar playing and yeah. everything with a lot of the tracks on the soundtrack so what what makes you say that this one is from clark powell specifically mostly because of the instrumentation and the way that the soundtrack kind of fits around this track in particular this it's a little more structured i think than jesper kid's stuff normally okay. i think jesper kid normally does like a lot of like really kind of off the wall outlandish stuff it takes a little bit more risk and this played out a little bit more safe it's very marchy yeah like walky like as soon as it started and i heard that dun 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 yeah i just pictured this giant like lumbering creature mm -hmm. like just walking through a field like like shadow of the colossus yeah. or something like that and then like those little twinklies were really cool like mm -hmm. that i love that hi-hat in the left channel yeah <laughs> yeah that <laughs> Yeah, it was yeah. cool because it, you know it felt slow and fast at the mm -hmm. same time. Like I don't know, like there's a big ominous thing in the background, but rapid things are happening in the foreground. That's how a lot of the soundtrack feel. is, especially when you're fighting bosses. I believe this came from a boss track. Okay, but I don't remember a lot of the soundtrack. I could definitely see this as a boss track. Oh, absolutely. The the soundtrack in general just kind of flows really well together. So you kind of. Uh, the tracks stand out like in the back of your head like I could tell you when a certain when some of the tracks played but then others I'm kind of like it, it kind of gets lost on me because there's a lot of very quiet moments in the game mm -hmm. too but I spent 90 hours with this one uh, I 90 it. hours 90 hours I, I spent a lot of time and that's such a big deal for me because I don't normally spend that much time with games and I don't normally play RPGs but I gave this one a shot I'm really glad I did you know I reviewed it for the channel uh, so you if you haven't checked out the review, please go check it out. It's essentially a dungeon crawler that kind of meets like Final Fantasy, like traditional JRPG, but it's using the uh, franchise Battle Chasers, which is a comic book franchise that came out by Joe Maderera, who worked on like a lot of Marvel comics, DC comics type stuff. He went on to do the Darksiders games. Uh, and he made his own uh, video game company, and he was working on that for years and years and years. And then when THQ basically shut down and his development house shut down, they made a new development house called Airship Syndicate, and they worked on this game. Yep. Uh, basically taking his fr his longstanding franchise, and he was like, I got this great franchise. I don't really know what to do with it. Tons of lovable, really cool characters. What do I do with it? So they did a Kickstarter. The game was successful. And they put it out. And I really don't think enough people check this one out because it's really cool. It's kind of like Final Fantasy meets Diablo in a way. Okay. Uh, so the dungeons themselves are isometric where you're going around. And there's a little bit of a random aspect to it. I've, I've, over the years, I've always said I don't like randomness in games. I like structure. I like being able to go into you know, play like Ninja Gaiden 2 and know that Ninja Gaiden 2 is always going to be Ninja Gaiden 2. Yeah. But uh, I recently have been trying to warm up a little bit and expand my horizons in terms of uh, different game styles. And one of the ones that always really uh, struck a nerve with me was games with random elements in it. You know, you've talked about Crypt and the Necrodancer quite a bit. And, it, and every time you mention it, I'm like, yeah, pretty cool soundtrack, but ugh, random. Yeah. Random, you know, dungeons and yeah, stuff like, like ro that. Yeah, like Rogue Legacy, those kind yeah, of things. Yeah, like yeah. roguelikes. And so I've been trying to do games that are like roguelike likes or, or rogue, rogue, rogue light. Rogue light. Yes, yeah. that's the perfect way to put it. So essentially you go in and you go into a dungeon uh, after walking around this various map and when you find a dungeon, you go into it and you get three characters and you're running around with just one character and when you get into battles it's side like 2d you know final fantasy like classic final fantasy like um uh, like final fantasy 6 final fantasy 5 you know that kind of style where bad guys on one side good guys on the other yep it's just a lot of fun it's a really really good game yeah musically it's fantastic uh, it's a lot of this type of music so if you enjoyed this kind of stuff uh, there's a lot of it throughout the entire experience. Yeah, definitely check out the uh, video that Mike made 
I guest star in it, so yes. it's a little bit of a Pixel Tunes. Yep. And I did not spend 90 hours learning my lines, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, no. So we were it, a little lopsided on that one. If you like Pixel Tunes and you like the dynamic that we have a lot, where like I'm more the slapstick guy and Ed's kind of the straight-laced guy, uh, you'll you'll really dig this one. So uh, definitely check out that review. But yeah, Mana Surge, great track. Clark Powell, uh, just to give you a little bit, because we've talked about Jesper Kid. Uh, Clark Powell is mostly known for the mu doing music for the, the webcomic Homestuck. So uh, he's done a couple indie albums as well that are on Bandcamp. You can check out his Bandcamp page. It's clarkpowell.bandcamp.com. Right on. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And now, what do you got for us? You got also another kind of newish game, right? Yeah, this, this music actually kind of fits in with the last track that we just heard. We played a track from the spiritual sequel to this game on a previous episode, which was called Transistor. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is Bastion, the original uh, isometric kind of game that came out from composer Darren Korb. Uh, and the title of this track is Twisted Streets. Let's take a listen to it. Right, that was Twisted Streets from the game Bastion, which came out on a whole bunch of systems and platforms in 2011, and it was written by Darren Korb. And I feel like this kind of is a good compliment to the 
Battle Chasers track. It's got yeah. kind of a very marchy, gritty, almost uh, militaristic kind of a beat um, with, you know, like a slower background with more of a kind of like a fluty uh, melody line going for it. This is this is the kind of stuff I used to listen to, like, in the 90s. When you were listening to the Assault Android Cactus kind of stuff, mm-hmm. I was listening to, like, very marchy industrial kind of music. Hmm. I really really love this soundtrack uh this and the soundtrack to transistor darren corb has just got this style that really resonates with me it's very organic but at the same time like organic sounds that you don't exactly know how they're made <laughs> you know right how how people have come across you know making these sounds with some electronics in the background and stuff but mostly it feels like traditional instruments that have kind of been mutated and filtered and and still sound really cool together and combinations that you might not normally hear this one twisted streets is just kind of one of those tracks that you would hear during your like the city areas of the game and it just has this very kind of like driving feel like you just kind of want to keep running and getting through the game while it's while it's playing what, what was your opinion i do like this track i really love the bass mm. in it specifically you mentioned organic and that really kind of resonates here you've got like this like almost chrono trigger-esque sound to it like do 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 like those yeah, note yeah. bends like that almost like an upright bass a little bit mm-hmm. That really hit home for me. That that was something that I, I kind of st- it stood out to me. Um, at points, it was a little reggae-ish. Okay. Like, almost like an electronic reggae. Yeah. It was pretty neat. Uh, you know, you don't really hear a lot of this type of music in video games, so it was neat to hear it. But I thought it was pretty cool. Um, I've heard great things about this game. I haven't checked it out. I have Transistor. Like, I downloaded it shortly after. It was, like, on sale for, like, a dollar or something like that. I think we played it together at one yep. point. Because when we put we, it in the show... The we, indie show, We got yeah. together and, and played a couple of the games. Yep. And you, you really liked that one. I so. really liked it. I thought it was cool. So I ended up downloading it, and I was glad I did. I, I would love to spend some time with it. But I, I loved the kind of, like deep dark atmosphere that they were kind of going for but also kind of like a sci-fi thriller kind of thing yeah i know that this game bastion's more like um like fantasy based no you know how transistor takes place in like a like a city this takes place in more of like earlier times i guess i wouldn't exactly call it fantasy but it's not like you're like there's magic and monsters and stuff but there's a, a city that's been like completely rendered to ashes in this grand calamity and the city has a a giant structure called a bastion and your character who's only referred to as the kid wakes up in this kind of like floating concrete area and uh is kind of tasked with getting to this bastion realizing that the bastion needs power to be able to kind of restore the world and so he's got to collect all these powered shards to get this bastion up and running again to, mm. to get the power to bring everything back from the calamity during that time, he meets this narrator who's got this excellent, like, very gravelly voice. It's just a kind of a joy to listen to every word he says. Hmm. And so the kid doesn't speak at all, but the narrator will kind of dictate, you know, like a, like a narrator in a book would kind of, like, explain what's going on. Very similar to Transistor, where uh, there's a sword that kind of talks to you as you go, kind of taking the place of the narrator. This... It's kind of like a ghostly, omniscient kind of a narrator. It's kind of like uh, whenever they put Patrick Stewart in a in a role in a video game, <laughs> yeah. you just want to like kind of listen. Exactly, and, the and... one redeeming quality of Lords of Shadow. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was Patrick Stewart voicing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and again, this is an isometric view, sprite-based, hand-painted graphics, which are utterly gorgeous, just like in Transistor. Uh, the isometric view is really cool because as you're going through this world, the map that you're on will kind of crumble behind you and kind of raise up in front of you depending on where you go like fez a little bit yeah i guess kind of i'm trying to think of a a, like a like a zelda game where you've got you know you kind of like okay but not so much that like you have to time it so that you don't fall off the level it just kind of appears before you right so being isometric it kind of gives you that that sense of things appearing behind and, and in front and um, giving you some more perspective on where you can go, and it just makes everything look really cool as it kind of like meshes together mm. out of these blocks. Uh, and it's got a, kind of a more RPG style. So Transistor was more of kind of an action game where you would plot out how you're going to hit people, and then your character would take a track as she kind of like slices through enemies. This one, everything kind of like stops when you have a battle, and then you've got to like do it like kind of like active time, almost like Final Fantasy, where you would pick your hits and stuff like that. So. Mm. Great game to play. It's a it's a not too difficult. You can get through it pretty easily. Uh, you can find it on your iPad. They even turned it into a browser game for Google Chrome. So wow. 
Uh, it sold over 5 million copies. It was very successful, mm. especially for an indie game. Yeah, yeah, that's and so, awesome. Yeah, Supergiant Games developed both of them. Darren Korb really only worked on these two games so far. He's had other commercial music come out. He was a friend of the developers who was not planning on going into video game music composition, but they were like, hey, we know you, you make music. Do you want to try making some music for this video game? And he was like, sure, I'll take the risk and won awards for it. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, definitely worth his while, and That's awesome. I hope he makes more soundtracks in the future, because I love listening to them. Hmm. All right, what do we got on the last of our list today? All right, our last track is returning back to the Super NES for Front Mission, and this is the 1995 release. The track is called Take the Offensive, and it's by Yoko Shimomura and Noriko Matsueda. I'm very offended. I'm taking the offense. Oh, Man. boo. <laughs> <laughs> That little ditty was from Front Mission on the Super NES. That was the 1995 release, and the track Take the Offensive was created by Yoko Shimomura and Noriko Matsueda. Yeah, I think Shimomura had the lead composer credit yeah. for that game. So, what do you what do you think of this one? It's very RPG. <laughs> it's yeah. very Shimomura. Very square. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with her uh, Live a Live, Live Alive yep. soundtrack. It sounds very much like stuff that would come right out of there very bombastic lots of horns mm -hmm. uh, kind of a either a battle theme or music that would take place at an RPG as you were approaching uh, a castle mm -hmm. or something like that there would be some sort of pageantry going on so uh, I'm not sure how much that would fit into like a mech battle game like Front Mission is so I'm yeah. curious just to, to find out where this song would have taken place <laughs> in the game probably when you're like building armies and stuff oh, I mean maybe, it's yeah. a tactical role playing game so it was actually only published by Squaresoft it was developed by G-Craft but I believe the Front Mission series in general has kind of always been like Squaresoft's baby if you will yeah so, yeah um, but yeah, it involves these like mechs that are called Wanzers. You know, there's all these different battle zones that uh, the gameplay takes place in. So the name Wanzers comes from Wanderpanzer, uh, which is a German word for but walking you, tank. Yeah, walking tank. Right, right. So yeah, there's a lot of like customization you could do in this game, like with uh, different like weapons, and you get these like auxiliary backpacks and stuff that you can use, different parts and whatnot. You know, you get a lot of customization here. So. Along with that, like, the different frame of the parts, uh, like the body, the left arm, the right arm, the legs, etc. So, it's pretty neat. I, I haven't really spent much time with it, in all honesty. I would like to check it out, but uh, the soundtrack really kind of makes me want to play it. It's a shame that this one only came out in Japan for the initial Super Famicom release. It did get a release later on as a re-release Nintendo DS game in the States. Yeah, I think it came out on the PlayStation as well. Only in Japan. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, and then I also, remember maybe a trans like a fan translation has is out for the Super Probably. Nintendo version. There's, I'm sure there's a ROM of it that has like a translated version of yeah, it. Yeah, it's extremely popular. Yep. Very popular series. Yeah, so. it's, it's got a bunch of entries. So um, yeah, I just really dig this track. You know, I was looking for something that was kind of out of my wheelhouse, and I found it because I wouldn't. I don't think I would have played this otherwise. The yeah. isometric viewpoint is kind of like the. I guess developers have decided upon it as like the best perspective for tactical mm -hmm. games because you know ogre battle uh, and and a lot of the the tactical 
RPGs always use an isometric viewpoint yep. because it's the easiest way to kind of see a large amount of area on a screen with a low resolution. So, and, and yeah. you kind of gauge your distance between you and the enemy and moving around north, south, east, west, mm -hmm. you know, instead of a, a direct kind of boring overhead view. Right. You know, like you get in Zelda or something it's like that. It's a little bit more dynamic. It, it gives you a little bit more to look at. And it looks uh, more interesting, too. Yeah. yeah drawing yeah. sprites from a diagonal angle mm -hmm. feels a little cooler, I guess, than just seeing a flat back or a flat front of a right. character all the time. Gives things a little bit more of a challenge for the for the art creators, too. Like, creating all the lands and items and players and right. everything. So You're drawing in quarters instead of just exactly. up, down, left, right. Yeah. So this one is uh, composed by two ladies, uh, Yoko Shimomura, who we talked about a little bit earlier. Known for Final Fight, Kingdom Hearts, Smash Brothers did work on pretty much like a, a good chunk of the Smash Brothers series with starting with Brawl. Also did the music for Parasite Eve 1 and 2. Uh, well, 2 is only referenced for the original Parasite Eve music that came from the first game right. in 2. So any music that was in the second one. Hyper Street Fighter 2, the Anniversary Edition, did sound on that. Very well known for Street Fighter. Xenoblade Chronicles, the 2010 game, which came out on the Wii. So th her last game is Mario and Luigi Superstars Saga Bowser's Minions. Yeah, and which, she's still working. Yep. You know, when more Mario and Luigi games come out, I'm mm -hmm. sure you'll see her as... Yep credit for those as well. Yeah, so. she's pretty much always been on that franchise ever since the Super Mario RPG days, which we talked about a little earlier, and she's exactly. done, for the most part, almost every single Mario and Luigi game. Yeah, and she's so versatile. I yep. mean, you look at this stuff, and then you look at the rock stuff from, mm -hmm. from Street Fighter 2, yeah, and then fight, everything the in between, elements, yeah. the, the very Nintendo-sounding stuff from Mario mm -hmm. and Luigi, so she works great for an RPG environment, because, mm -hmm. especially with like the Mario and Luigi stuff, because then you've got that hard rock stuff when Bowser comes out, yep. You've got the, the floaty, breezy stuff when you're in the Mushroom Kingdom, mm -hmm. and she just nails every single piece she does. So, Definitely. Very talented woman. And then the other lady who worked on this, Noriko Matsueda, worked on Front Mission. That was her first game in 1995 as far as composition goes. Also worked on Bahamut Lagoon, Front Mission 2, Racing Lagoon, The Bouncer in 2000, which was a uh, launch title for the oh, PlayStation yeah. 2. Oh, yeah. I have the soundtrack to that, yep. actually, on CD. Final Fantasy X2. Uh, did, which was a sequel, like the first Final Fantasy, like official sequel in 2003. It was credited for the original music on Theater Rhythm, Final Fantasy The Curtain Call, which came out in the 3DS, and then Final Fantasy Explorers, which came out in 2014. So she's also thanked on Toeball Number 1 and Chrono Trigger. I'm not sure as to why, maybe just like help with different tracks, but I don't think she actually composed anything in any, either of those. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Well, that pretty much does it for our music for the show. Yes. We hope you guys enjoyed it. And we always welcome your comments mm -hmm. at facebook.com slash groups slash radio. You can find the post where the show is located and let us know what you think. Are there other isometric games with awesome soundtracks that we should have put on the show or stuff that you want to share? Leave it in the comments. We miss you guys coming out only once a month. Yeah. So we'd love to hear from you as often as possible. Yeah. Uh, the Facebook group has definitely stayed active even though the shows haven't been releasing as often which is great and, yeah. I, and I, I think we got a really great response from the last episode the pc98 episode went over really well yep yep yeah i was pretty happy about that so yeah we love hearing your comments and uh love engaging with you guys so make sure to do that you could find the post when we post it and this one will be released at the end of the month uh, just like they all are. So Last Wednesday of the month. That's right. Do not forget that. Yes. And next episode is going to be equally cool. Michael, what do we have coming up for the audience next? We have Batman. We're doing an entire episode on Batman. The character, the games, tons of classic music, but also some stuff that you may have never heard or is kind of like on the back burner of stuff that you wanted to play but you never got around to it so uh, ed and i are gonna dive deep into the batman series of games and check out all the good music i mean we'll probably check yeah. out the bad music too but we won't put that in the show <laughs> no no <laughs> uh you could also email us at pixeltunes radio at gmail.com send us an email tell us what you thought of the episode that's the best way to communicate with us aside from facebook you can also comment on our blog at pixeltunesradio.com uh not so many people comment there but we always respond when people comment uh, we love to hear from you guys on there if you don't have a social media platform and you just want to comment anonymously or whatever that's a great place to do it 
For those of you who do, though, have Twitter. We are at Pixeltoons Radio, so you could check us out there. Uh, my handle on Twitter is at DYHPTG, the call letters of my show. Dude, you haven't played this game, which you could also watch on YouTube.com forward slash Dongled along with all the episodes of Pixel Tunes Radio. And then Ed has his own Twitter and side podcast. Sure, you can find me at Ruiner9 on Twitter. You can also take a listen to The Impulse Project, where we play music from the demo scene and the tracking community. Uh, if you dug the uh, Last Ninja 2 soundtrack uh, song at the beginning of the show from the Commodore 64, you'll hear a lot of Commodore 64 music on The Impulse Project, as well as stuff from the Amiga, the Game Boy... Uh, the Genesis, all written by hobbyist composers. Some really mm-hmm. good stuff um, yeah. from some friends that hang out in our Facebook group as well. So yeah. check it out. So what about uh, this episode? What was your favorite track? I'm going to go with that Lunar Nights yeah. track. I really dug that. You know, it's crossed between that and Assault Android Cactus. I also I also really like the uh, Sonic 3D Blast. Mm. So, But I think overall... Lunar Nights really, really took it for me. I just, I can't get over that, that fretless bass yeah. line. That was so good. Uh, it's tough, you? tough, tough. I'm torn between either Battle Chasers Night War, just because I've spent so much time with it, <laughs> or honestly, uh, Assault Android Cactus really impressed me. Yeah, that's I was good. The whole soundtrack is amazing. Really kind of impressed not only by the game, but by the music itself. It looks and sounds really cool, so I'm going to have to check that one out in depth. Cool. So combined score, I'd say Assault Android Cactus is the winner, considering yeah. that was my, my second place and your first place. Yeah, yeah. So we'll call that the track of the show. Definitely. And we'd like to hear what your guys' track of the show is as well. Leave yes. us a comment, leave us an email, leave us sky riding. Sky riding. Yeah. Yeah, smoke signals. Right. <laughs> Isometric track of the show. Yeah, yeah. All oh, right. Oh, fitting in with the Batman thing, you could put uh, Batman... Uh, the bat signal? The, the bat signal, except the PTR signal. What would the PTR <laughs> signal look like? It'd just be a giant... Slice of cheese. With a pickle. Swiss cheese with a pickle yeah, on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening. And as always, we will see you, well, I was going to say in two weeks, but we'll see you in one month. Thanks for listening to Pixel Tunes Radio. Peace out. Welcome to Pixel Tunes Radio. A pie. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I forgot <laughs> what we say.